it's great to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our last meeting here of the council. Um, I We here at Duke Margolis have been so impressed by your enthusiasm and your active participation in this in this series of meetings. I think it really has led to a lot of great information sharing and connections among people. And, and so just really wanted to have, you know, provide sincere thanks for all of the, the time you've put into it. I know it's such a busy time. Um, and I think Mark may have joined us now if he wants to kick it off or I can turn to Mandy. Mark, are you on? Oh, you're on mute. There he is, okay. I don't think we can hear him though. I don't think we can hear you, Mark. No. Okay, I, we still can't hear you. Maybe I'll just turn to... Okay. All right, so he's gonna to try to fix it. I'm gonna to turn to Mandy for a few minutes because I know she wanted to say something at the outset and then hopefully Mark can get his audio fixed. Go ahead, Mandy. Well, thanks, Amy. Thanks and uh, <laughs> welcome to our Zoom world. Uh, you're on mute, <laughs> I can't connect. Uh, but I, um, first I just wanted to, this is our last official uh, convening of the, the coverage council. It's been four incredible, uh, sessions I'm including today because I know it's going to be incredible. Um, but I, I just want to say truly thank you. I think that this council has been one of the most engaged um, I have participated on, not just during the meetings, but in between working sessions and trying to come to a place with an open mind to come to some consensus around principles, I think has been really helpful. Um, and I think we've looked at a wide range of, of of uh, types of, of policies. We're gonna hear more uh, today about what other states are doing. Um, and we've really tried to keep focused on coverage um, and thinking about, well, what are the things that we we can see our way forward to? So thank you uh, for that that deep engagement for um, particularly those who, who don't live in the healthcare space all of the time, particularly our business, colleagues um, who, who are, are, are joining, um, those of us in hospital insurance, uh, doctor, nurse world, we live in it all the time. And thank you as well to all of you. Um, but I'm particularly thankful to, to those who are diving into some of these details um, with us to really try to find our, our way forward as a state of North Carolina. Um, I know it's been a hard year for everyone with COVID on top of everything else, but I think that's all the more reason why this, this council is so important. So just a thank you. I know the governor's gonna join us um, at, at noon to sort of, uh, you know, I'm sure add his own uh, thanks and remarks about where we go from here, uh, but I'm looking forward to a really good discussion, further refining those principles and coming out of uh, here with, um, with, that, with, with those principles to, to guide our further work. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, and Secretary Cohen, I think I may be audible now. You <laughs> are. Yeah. Welcome back. Okay, you are. Uh, yeah. So I'll be very brief as well. Um, it's been, as, as Haney said, it's been impressive for us to see the willingness of people who are really busy with a lot of other things in the pandemic response uh, to take time to think about how we can work together on making coverage more affordable and available in North Carolina. There have been a lot of good ideas that have come up that I think potentially can come together in some very effective steps. Uh, we're going to have another constructive discussion about those today. I'm sure that um, some further ideas will come out of this too, you know, by, by no means is the whole work on making progress on, on affordable coverage going to be done today. But it really is a, a, a strong foundation that has come out of these past three meetings. Um, we're going to try and emphasize today the, uh, the opportunities for uh, you all to work together in smaller groups that seemed to be very productive last time to refine the principles and to think about um, combinations of approaches uh, that may work here. And um, while this is the last meeting of the council, uh, this is an area where we obviously want to be as supportive as possible to all of your efforts to uh, uh, improve health and healthcare in the state. So thanks again for joining us today. Uh, we're going to turn now to going through uh, some of the uh, follow up from the topics that you all raised in our last meeting in terms of um, other uh, or a variety of approaches for uh, 
improving uh, and uh, expanding coverage, uh, and then go into those breakout discussions around the finalization of the principles and some potential further ideas for where to go from here. So thanks again, I'm looking forward to today's discussions. And uh, Hamy, with that, I'd like to turn back to you. Okay. Um... Well, good to see everybody. Um, Mark mentioned what we're going to be doing today. And I wanted to, as always, encourage you to be the active participants that you've been throughout these series of meetings. Um, you know, we always try to, to call on you when we see you and you are very active in the chat. So please, um, you know, raise your questions, thoughts. That's what this session is, is really designed to do is really make sure that you all have the opportunity to engage. Uh, as Mark mentioned, um, we're just gonna take a couple of minutes at the beginning of the meeting um, you should have received yesterday um, a response to some of the questions that were raised in the third meeting. Um, I have to give credit to Elaine Sheehan, who's here with me today from Duke Margolis. She really um, did an incredible job um, pulling together some responses to those questions that we really wanted to have for you. So we're gonna just take a couple minutes to review what's in there. I, I won't go through a lot of detail, but just wanted to make sure you were aware. And if there are any follow-ups from that, that we're, we're able to answer that for you either here today or following up afterwards. Um, after that, we're going to hear from uh, a little bit more about Georgia's experience, um, what they got approved from CMS and where they are in their planning. And so again, for that session, please bring your questions. I think we do want that to be an interactive session. And then we're going to get um, to what I hopefully is going to be the fun part of the meeting where we get to go into breakouts again. Um, I, I really thought those, those went really well um, last time and we wanted to repeat them. You will be in the same group. Um, just because we thought it would make sense to continue conversations. And we hope those can provide a forum for you all to, like, to take a look at the guiding principles. We, we um, changed those and I'll go through those a little bit before we break out to show you kind of the big changes that we made um, based on your feedback in the third meeting. And then we'll go into these breakouts where you can talk about that a little bit more, provide your thoughts, um, considerations as we get to the finalizing of the principles, which we hope to do pretty much by the end of this session. And then we'll send out a copy for you all to review next week. And then we will be, we will be done with that, with that really Herculean task. And I, again, I just have to thank you for all of the active participation. I really think we came up with a really um, strong foundational set of principles. And then after that, we'll talk about next steps. Um, where do we go from here? I, I think a number of you um, brought up last meeting, and we'll talk about this today, about how the principals um, you know, put out you know, high level foundational ideas, but where does North Carolina really wanna go with respect to specific strategies? So we can talk a little bit about that and you know, how the work that we do here in this council you know, during this last meeting, how, how that can extend beyond. So that will be a really good time to share, you know, everything that's happened in the breakout sessions and then talk a little bit about looking forward. And then as Mandy, as Secretary Cohen mentioned, we'll, we'll hear from the governor and his thoughts on how this can all fit together and looking into the future. So um, I think it's going to be a great um, next about two hours. So um, keep up the enthusiasm and the energy and we will keep going. So, okay, next slide, please. All right. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, so as I mentioned um, in your emails, you got um, a response that Elaine pulled together with help from um, the North Carolina DHHS team after that really great presentation we had last meeting on some of the follow-up questions. One of the questions that you all had was, you know, what are the differences between small and group markets with respect to coverage requirements? So just wanted to, I won't read everything on this slide, but just wanted to share with you um, that you know, the Affordable Care Act did impose um, different sets of requirements for these different groups. For the small groups, which they the ACA defines as less than or equal to 50 full-time employees, they are guaranteed group coverage. You can have premiums set based on geography, ages of enrollees, and tobacco use. And then they impose some additional standards where you know, these plans have to actually cover essential health benefits, meet benchmark plans, um, et cetera. I won't read everything on there, but just wanted to be sure you were aware that, that that's in, in your written response and something that we were just going to touch on today. The large group market has um, a slightly different set of requirements. It's, um, you know, 51 employees and greater. They are, that group is not guaranteed group coverage and premiums are typically set based on past plans and negotiation. They have um, slightly different standards for um, need, needing to need a minimum essential coverage. So you can't have plans that are just dental or just vision, et cetera. And 85% of the premium must be spent on healthcare services. Okay, next slide, please. 
um, wanted to talk a little bit about, um, there was a question around, well, what's the difference in costs between small and group markets um, for out of pocket? And so this is just a snapshot. Again, I won't read everything on the slide. I just wanted to make you aware that, you know, we did include that in the response of the range of costs. And this is specific to North Carolina based on um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and um, quality data. Um, so any follow-up questions there, let us know. But um, this is something actually Julia pulled um, from the publicly available information that's that that has the cost uh, projection. So great. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about association health plans. There was a pretty robust discussion in last meeting about association health plans and, and some questions around how those could be structured and what are the different pieces. So I will just spend a little bit more time on this one. Um, so you know, basically there are two pathways um, for association health plans. Pathway one existed um, before the Affordable Care Act, before the rule that was put out by the Bush and uh, Trump administration. Um, and it's it basically um, under the ACA, association health plans have to meet the individual and small market plan rules, which I mentioned in the earlier slide around like including essential health benefits and how premiums are set. So they have to meet those requirements. There's a limited exception um, for association health plans that are covering small employers, like which is um, less than or equal to 50 employees. But those groups have to be bound by common interests, such as common trade, business, or profession, and effectively operate as one employer controlling the association. So, you know, there is some, some pretty clear definitional pieces that to allow um, an exemption from those otherwise applicable AC requirements. Um, one of the things that um, we heard about, I think it was in the second meeting about association health plans, were that, um, you know, the benefits would include allowing, you know, small employers to band together to purchase insurance, leverage economies of scale to achieve cost savings and customized plans. But one thing just to think about is there also may be, um, as a result, higher premiums for older and sicker individuals and groups just because of the, the way the risks would be allocated um, based on those plans. There is a pathway too that was established um, through um, the US Department of Labor. Um, they issued a rule back in 2018 that really expanded the definition of um, association health plans and which small groups could be considered a large group and made it a lot more flexible, frankly, um, to allow um, folks to come together and constitute um, a large group and purchase insurance. But back in March 2019, the, a federal judge invalidated much of this new rule, saying that it st saying that it violated ERISA. And at the moment, it's not currently being implemented in states. So, and we um, anticipate that the Biden administration will roll back that rule. So, the gist of it is really, you know, what's the future opportunity for association health plans is most likely going to be pathway one. Um, we included um, a reference to Pennsylvania about, you know, they actually added additional standards on top of, you know, what was already required um, with respect to the operation of association health plans. That, but that pathway would still exist. It's just, I, you know, frankly, more limited than what was going to be allowed under the 2018 rule um, that the Trump administration put out. So I just wanted to clarify that piece. Okay, next slide. Um, there was a couple of questions around um, extending Medicaid coverage in for limited populations. And so we really wanted to make sure we share that information with you. Um, and it's again in the written responses that you got, but also wanted to just quickly touch on it now. So this map shows um, where is cover where have states um, tried to extend Medicaid coverage for pregnant women. Last meeting we talked a little bit about how, you know, currently under the Medicaid program, 60 days postpartum, um, women lose coverage as you know as a result of their pregnancy, and that's um, that's the case in across the country in states. There are several states that have passed legislation to extend postpartum coverage. It's certainly something that's of interest across the country. You'll see here on this map, um, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, New Jersey, and Missouri um, have applied for a Section 115 demonstration waiver to extend postpartum coverage beyond the 60 days. But um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or, or CMS, has not acted on those requests. So those are right now outstanding. And we'll just have to see um, how the new administration will address those types of requests. Now, these include states that have already um, expanded Medicaid, but they, they wanted to have an a option for individuals who qualified as a pregnant woman to have their coverage continue under that category for up to, frankly, a year is what most of them asked for. Um, 
South Carolina is interesting. They had an, a section 1115 demonstration approved by CMS and that approval included a thousand additional slots for coverage where the state can prioritize people who are in need of substance use disorder treatment. And of those thousand slots of people who need the SUD treatment, that can include uh, women up to 12 months postpartum. So, you know, it's it's more limited than what these other states are, are asking for, but it, there is an option to cover some women if they need substance use disorder treatment, if it fits in those thousand slots that they're opening up. Um, California and Texas. Now, California implemented in August 2020 and Texas implemented in September 2020, the big yellows here, these big states. Um, they use state-only funds to provide 12 months of coverage to a subset of pregnant women. Um, California's extended postpartum coverage is targeted to women diagnosed with a maternal mental health condition. And Texas's limited coverage extension is for women eligible for the family planning program. So they decided we're going to go ahead and use state funds to provide these limited expansions of coverage for these um, targeted uh, populations. And then you can see the rest of the blue. Um, there's you know an additional 15 states that have related legislation pending. So definitely an area of interest, and it will be interesting to see how uh, we move along um, with the new administration and where the opportunities are for states on that. Okay, next slide, please. Um, there was a question about, because we talked a little bit about um, extending Medicaid coverage for parents of children in foster care. So, you know, parents who may be currently eligible for the Medicaid program and then lose their eligibility because their children go to foster care. Um, you know, we actually did not I identify any state that, that had targeted expansion just for this group. It's pretty small numbers. Um, if, if, you know, North Carolina was interested in uh, tackling just that group, it would likely require a Section 115 demonstration. But looking across the states, generally states have just included um, expansion of coverage as a, as a broader Medicaid expansion and have included those, those folks in those broader, you know, full Medicaid expansion. I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, okay, wanted to talk a little bit about um, extending Medicaid coverage for individuals with substance use disorder. So there, there are two states that we identified the pursued targeted expansions just for that piece of the pie. Um, Virginia um, had what's called a GAP program. Before they fully expanded Medicaid, they um, got approval from CMS to offer a limited physical and behavioral health benefit to uninsured adults with serious mental illness who had incomes up to 100% of FPL. Um, so this again was before they, they made the decision to fully expand Medicaid. They took a targeted approach where they just expanded coverage to this smaller subset of individuals. Utah, um, sort of the same theory. They Again, before they fully expanded Medicaid, they um, got approval to cover a capped number of childless adults, up to 5% of the federal poverty level who are chronically homeless, involved in the criminal justice system and in need of behavioral health treatment. So again, a small number of individuals um, really focused, frankly, they had a lot of homeless um, in Salt Lake City and they really wanted to target that population. And so this, this piece was really targeted to those folks. Um, since then, they have fully expanded and those individuals are covered under their full expansion. Um, another piece we just wanted to highlight for you, there is an option, not to get too technical, but there's a Section 1915I state plan authority to expand Medicaid eligibility to targeted groups of individuals who are at risk of institutional level of care, up to 100% of the federal poverty level, and who would be eligible under an existing home and community-based services waiver. So there is an option to expand eligibility just with that with that limited piece. Okay, great. All right, next slide. Um, expanding coverage up to 100% of the federal poverty level. So wanted to just um, provide a couple of examples of states that have done this. Again, they haven't fully expanded Medicaid uh, up to 138% of the federal poverty level, which is you know what needs to qualify for enhanced match as of as of now. We'll see if there's any changes in that, but that's as of now. Um, Wisconsin, Georgia, and Utah were all states that pursue limited expansions, and um, we're going to hear a little bit more about Georgia, so I won't say much about that now, but Wisconsin, um, back in 2014, they got approval to expand um, their Medicaid program up to um, 100% for individuals up to 100% of the federal poverty level with the remaining folks then being able to go to the exchanges and qualify for subsidies on the exchanges. That program um, is financed at their regular match. They don't qualify for enhanced match, but it is still currently in effect. And that is how they're providing coverage for, for that population. Utah, as I mentioned earlier, they also received 
um, approval from CMS to cover people up to 100% of the federal poverty level and not go up to 138%. They wanted enhanced match. They didn't get the enhanced match. They got regular match for those people. But the, since then, because there was a ballot initiative in their state, they went ahead and um, did full Medicaid expansion for that entire population. Okay, so um, I want to next um, move so we can hear a little bit more about Georgia. But before I do that, does anyone have any follow-up questions on any of that? Um, just want to make sure people had a moment to raise their hand if they had anything. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone coming off mute, so just feel free to speak if I don't see you. Okay. All right. And if anyone has follow-up questions after this, you know where to reach us. Um, you can always email and we're happy to respond to anything. Um, where, if you want more information or clarification, um, please just follow up with us and we're happy to provide that to you. Okay, um, I want to go ahead and introduce now um, Dr. Kenneth Thorpe. He's a professor and chair of health policy and management at Emory University. And he's gonna talk a little bit more about um, what's happening in Georgia. So Dr. Thorpe, if I could turn it to you now. And I think you're on mute. Yes, no, yeah. no thank you. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, uh, Secretary Cohen and, and Mark, great to see you again, as always. Um, uh, congratulations to all of you for pulling this council together, um, obviously on a very, very important topic. Um, I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about what uh, Georgia has done, uh, but as you deliberate and think about options, um, uh, with the new administration coming in, uh, uh, the Biden administration will have a big focus on expanding health care coverage uh, through a variety of mechanisms, both through insurance and through non-insurance mechanisms uh, as well to, uh, to provide health care coverage. But um, why don't I go through what, the, what Georgia did and let's just skip through to the, uh, to the third slide, Elaine. Maybe back up one, I think. So just to give you some context of where, of where this discuss, discussion came from, uh, it really started in 2015 and 2016 under uh, Governor Deal. And the genesis of it really was from the hospitals. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, Georgia has uh, Atlanta and some other large cities, but most of the hospitals are in rural areas. Uh, and their, their primary source of revenue is Medicare, Medicaid, and un uninsured. Uh, and as uh, the, the economy was kind of stumbling around, uh, the amount of uncompensated care facing these uh, small hospitals was growing. And there was increasing interest in finding ways to increase Medicaid coverage uh, to financially help these rural hospitals out so that they didn't go under. Um, in these communities, these hospitals are the major employer uh, for the most part. Uh, and so finding ways to expand coverage uh, started to get some traction. Uh, the challenge was is that uh, in the 2014, 15, 16 time period, uh, this is basically when the, uh, the Tea Party was still very, uh, very powerful. There are a lot of fiscal concerns over the cost of expanding Medicaid. Um, the governor made a decision to basically to throw the decision-making power, power to the uh, House and Senate um, so that uh, uh, it wasn't going to be so, so totally a governor's uh, decision. Uh, they did some estimates of what a full expansion of Medicaid would cost. Um, I think the numbers are a, a little bit high, but they came up with two and a half billion dollars over 10 years So, uh, on the state side. So facing those, those numbers, the state uh, decided to take a step back and really not uh, pursue it at the time. Uh, Governor Kemp came in. Uh, so in 2019, um, he, he again brought Medicaid expansion on the table. Uh, again, there was this tension between the, the costs of the program for a full expansion. Uh, There's also some concerns that uh, legislators had about the design and the effectiveness of Georgia's existing Medicaid program. So a lot of people were kind of opposed to what they thought was expanding a program that had many flaws in it. But the compromise view was to uh, find ways to expand coverage, but only to 100% of the poverty line. So next one. So the uh, 
General Assembly came out with a uh, piece of legislation that uh, uh, prompted the uh, the state to move towards a uh, 1115 waiver. Uh, like Utah, the original proposal was to expand to 100% of poverty, but they're asking for the enhanced 90% match. Uh, CMS just recently approved it in October uh, a modified version of this, uh, but again, it's uh, up to 100% of poverty at a lower match. Uh, it has not yet started. It doesn't start until July. Um, for a variety of reasons I'll talk about in a minute, uh, it's only estimated in the third or fourth year to cover about 52,000 uninsured. Um, the, the proposal had a couple of things in it that were necessary in order to develop a consensus between Republicans and Democrats. One was a work requirement. Um, currently, there are no states that have an active work requirement. Uh, there have been other states that have passed it, but they have all been blocked by court rulings that are still pending in Kentucky, Arkansas, and New Hampshire. Next. So what the waiver did was uh, expand coverage, as I mentioned, to 100% of poverty. Uh, the work requirements, uh, you have to demonstrate that uh, you're working, engaged in other activities such as community service or job training for at least 80 hours per month. Uh, secondly, if you have access to employer coverage uh, that you had to enroll in it and the state would provide assistance to help you pay your share of the premium in cost sharing. So obviously this is a, a major departure from other 1115 waivers that have been passed um, by only covering uh, individuals up to 100% rather than 138% and also having uh, the work requirements. Um, you'll see in a minute, there's also a, a provision in there that provides essentially sort of a health savings account type uh, approach to this as well to provide incentives to individuals enrolled in the program to stay healthy uh, and uh, uh, um, pursue and, and stay healthy, cut smoking rates and so on. Next. So uh, the, the estimates are that uh, this approach, <coughs> excuse me, this approach will cost about 375 million a year, about $1,600 per newly enrolled adult. Uh, there are premiums that people pay uh, so if you're under 50% of poverty, there's, there are no premiums. Uh, if you're 50 to 84%, uh, there's a $7 per month premium per person and a $3 uh, tobacco surcharge. Uh, that goes up to $11 per month uh, from 85 to 100% of poverty, again, with the same tobacco surcharge. Next. Uh, there, there is cost sharing uh, associated with it. So you can see it's it's, it's quite, mo quite modest. Um, uh, I think the good news in this is that there's no cost sharing for primary care. Uh, that's gonna be an area of tremendous focus in the Biden administration in providing universal primary care uh, services. So uh, the idea here is that we want to encourage individuals to seek primary care uh, and not discourage them from seeking primary care through having, a, 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 having cost sharing. Uh, next. Uh, the, the, the waiver also created what's called this member re rewards account. It almost sounds like a, something that Hilton or Marriott would put together. Um, but what it is basically is the premiums that people pay go into their account. Uh, and you can earn additional dollars uh, by completing annual well care visits, uh, complying with the uh, diabetes programs, uh, things like the diabetes prevention program. Uh, maintaining a, a body mass index under 30, which is uh, 30 and above is considered obese. Uh, and if you meet those markers, that additional dollars are put into your account. Uh, and the idea is, is that those additional dollars then can offset the premiums that people are paying in. Uh, they can use the account once it, uh, the balance hits $100 and, and it's capped at 500. So the structure of this was not just and again, this was the compromise in order to get this passed. The structure was not just to expand coverage, but also to include uh, incentives to work and include incentives uh, for, uh, for healthy behavior. Uh, and here using this member rewards account. The next. 
Uh, the benefits are basically the uh, uh, traditional Medicaid benefits that uh, Georgia provides. Uh, the only exception that they put in was for non-emergency uh, medical transportation. So what happens next? Obviously, this was an unusual 1115 waiver that was negotiated between the, a Republican governor in Georgia and the Trump administration. Uh, there, a, there were a lot of interesting things that went on uh, in, in the negotiations behind the scene, uh, but it's not clear exactly what's gonna happen going forward to this particular waiver. Um, uh, part of it is that uh, there's the, the healthcare team at HHS has not really been put together. There's no CMS administrator uh, as of yet. Um, uh, you know, the focus really uh, in the Biden administration right now is vaccines, 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 as, as it should be. Um, so not clear about what the future is. What I can say is that the, the healthcare agenda that he's putting forward um, is going to focus on tools that would enhance uh, the ability to get coverage through the current ACA rules, uh, increasing the premium subsidies to purchase coverage, uh, providing a universal primary care package, which is not an insurance-based approach, but really would cover 70 to 80% of the types of healthcare services that people need, and a focus on digital therapeutics, that is, uh, uh, proven wellness programs uh, that uh, are really inexpensive, but really help uh, patients with multiple chronic uh, conditions manage their diseases. So there's going to be a mix of insurance and non-insurance approaches uh, that they will be putting forward. So with that, uh, there's a really brief overview. I, I did not want to take a whole lot of time, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, wanted to open it up to members of the council to ask any questions you might have. Anyone have any some questions? Hey, this, this is Tunde. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you know, the comment about uncompensated care uh, was intriguing because I think that's, I don't know that we've been able to tag, you know, to what degree, um, most of the programs would reduce un uncompensated care. I mean, we know it will. Um, I think in North Carolina, we have the last numbers I saw was like a $1.3 billion being spent annually on uncompensated care. Mm -hmm. And if a third of our uninsured here in the state, uh, less than 138% of the FPL, I think that's the number. Um, do we, just based on the modeling that was done in Georgia, do they have a sense of by how much or to what degree uncompensated care would be reduced, even with a limited expansion, not even to talk about a full Medicaid expansion? Well, my sense, um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, and obviously other states have uh, approached this by doing expansion, but also then having an uncompensated care pool that funds hospitals uh, in order to pay for uncompensated care. Perhaps you know, New York State historically was probably the best known of that uh, in terms of uh, how they virtually eliminated uncompensated care in the state. But my sense is in Georgia, it, if you look at the total amount of uncompensated care it's probably gonna reduce about 10 to 20% of it. And it's only because the enrollment numbers are only picking up probably about 10% of the potential eligible uninsured under 138% of poverty. So the, the work requirements uh, in particular is something that's in terms of their modeling came up with lower enrollment numbers than if you, ha if you had no requirements. That is, if you just expanded coverage to everybody under 100% of poverty, no requirements at all. So it will make a difference uh, in terms of uncompensated care. Uh, but again, I think as, as I talked about, there are other approaches that you could couple this with that could have a, a dramatic impact on, on health outcomes and uncompensated care uh, in the state. 
Uh, I mentioned just briefly this uh, primary care package that the Biden administration is going to put forward uh, that would provide uh, universal primary care targeting people who don't have insurance. And these di digital, digital therapeutic <clears throat> programs that work through health coaching, again, a non-insurance approach, but proven to be very effective uh, in reducing costs uh, and uh, generating better outcomes. So I think there's a package of things that you could look at, insurance expansions and these other non-insurance approaches that could be very effective. Thank you. Representative Adcock had a question about um, what was the cost to Georgia of the administration of HSA type account for those covered up to 100% of FPL? You mentioned a third party administered it. Yeah, so I, I have not seen the, the change. So they, they made a decision to not use, you know, to try to use brokers uh, to provide insurance rather than doing pool through the exchanges. Um, you know, we, we know the the cost of using brokers is is higher than sort of a a pooled approach to this. Um, it, you know, it, again, it's a trade off that uh, there are people who want to use their own insurance brokers uh, uh, and so on to get coverage. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it probably adds anywhere from five to 10 percent additional costs in terms of uh, administrating uh, administrating the program. Great. Other questions? This is Representative Cunningham. I wanted him to uh, elaborate a little bit on the work requirement data, mm -hmm. how they were able to capture the data um, and the administration cost of capturing that data from the work pe from people that work. Well, it's it's got to be self re it's self reported. Okay. And so, uh, and, and if the individuals don't report it, uh, then they have a time period, a, a grace period, so to speak. Uh, to get the data in, but um, <clears throat> if they don't report it and provide documentation of it, then um, over a period of time, they, they would not be eligible for the benefits. So it's really self it's really documented by the by the individuals. And and so the follow up was the administration cost um, to the state of Georgia for you know even setting up a system for them to document it. Well, we, again, we don't, it, it's not clear yet because it doesn't start until July. Okay. So they're just kind of doing the planning right now to pull it together. Um, but we'll, we'll know more in a couple of months. Great. And then there's uh, a question this, about, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. This is Senator Robbins and I wanted to know, and I may have missed this, I know Georgia is very rural and there are rural hospitals that have taken care of people. Some you mentioned, um, you know, suffer. Well, I may be on the wrong slide, the closure. <laughs> but what has been the anticipated impact, even though it hasn't begun, but in terms of looking at this model, what did you anticipate being the impact on those rural hospitals that suffered mostly? from the uninsured populations and lack of, of, of revenue? Well, I think, you know, I think the view is that they, they would rather have had a full expansion to 138 with no requirements because that's gonna generate the most new revenue for them. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think that, that they're all appreciative of any efforts to expand coverage, even though it's only about 50,000 uh, statewide in the second or third year, because um, most of these hospitals that you're exactly right that are in small rural communities, you know, their revenue streams are Medicare, which barely, if, if at all covers costs, the existing Medicaid program, which probably pays a little bit below cost of treating and uninsured patients, obviously, which um, pays uh, virtually nothing. So even if you can get some of those uninsured patients up to Medicaid payment rates, that, that's, a, that's a win financially. Uh, so uh, they'll, I'm sure they'll keep working to push to find ways to continue to expand coverage either through using insurance or some of these other methods I talked about, these non-insurance approaches in order to get revenue flowing into the system. But 
Uh, not as much as they wanted. It was a, you know, a big compromise, but better than what they had. Okay. Right. And there's a follow-up question, and this may be um, more directed to North Carolina DHHS, but there is a question of how many North Carolina uninsured yeah. would be covered with if, if there was a coverage up to 100% of the federal poverty level? Georgia seemed to, I think Dr. Thorpe, you said 52,000 for, for Georgia, but I think they're wondering what about North Carolina? This is Julia. If you know that. Hi, Amy, this is Julia at North yeah. Carolina Medicaid. So uh, what we shared in the last meeting is we're projecting over 300,000 individuals would be covered uh, mm -hmm. by the third year uh, if we expanded up to 100% of FPL. Yeah, and that's really not that, that really not a whole lot different from what would have been covered in Georgia. Again, those are those are year three numbers that I was talking about. Uh, again, they, they just knocked them down a little bit because of the work. In order to be eligible, you had to meet the work requirements. So if there were no requirements and just a pure expansion to 100,000 or 100% of the federal poverty line, um, the numbers would have been in the two or 300,000 range. Uh, this is Representative Adcock again. I just cannot type fast enough. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to get out of the chat and ask my next question. So um, if North Carolina has 300,000 of our total uninsured population that would be covered by extending Medicaid to those who make less than 100% of federally uh, the federal poverty level, what's the cost to the state, though, if the match is 67% versus 90 that's my question, because I mean that's that's where you really kind of that's a big question to me. So um, what we what we shared was that that would be about nine hundred million dollars by the third year to cover those three hundred thousand. That's that's the non federal share. Right. Thank you. Sure. Hey Julia, just real quick though, it's nine hundred thousand up to a hundred. But it's actually less if we go up to 138. I think it was like 500 million or something because of the 90% federal share match. So I, I think that's that's an important point. Yeah, I mean, you, you make the point I didn't finish, and I appreciate that. Is that we cover? It, I mean, 300,000 people. That's not a small number. But when you look at the cost to add 300,000, you cover 300,000 people versus the cost of trying to get everybody, it's actually less to get everybody because we have a 90% match instead of a 67% match. Am I missing something? No. <laughs> okay, that's just what I wanted to just clarify. Thank you. And to add to that, that number actually doubles. Julia, if I remember, it goes to 600,000, interestingly enough, that we would cover yes. up to 138. Yeah. Right, we get a bigger, you get more juice for the squeeze. Exactly. Oh. Okay. Other questions on this? Just real quick, I don't think any state though has actually been able to move forward with work requirements. I mean, Arkansas, I mean, they all tried. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, Arkansas, I think Indiana and uh, Kentucky, if I recall. Right. But just, I mean, they're lawsuits, I think. Right. They're, all, they're all, all over the place. They're all pending lawsuits. So we'll have to see what happens here in Georgia. Yeah. Representative Cunningham, I got one last question. On the demographics of that 52,000. Are you, I'm sure you all are able to track it through your system is what does the, that population look like for that 52,000 people, that special carve out? Well, there, are we looking at that that is in the rural space of Georgia where that 52,000 additional people would be picked up? Well, I'm, I don't know that they've done a sort of geographic estimates of it. My sense is that probably uh, the bulk of it is going to come out of Atlanta, Columbus, and Savannah in terms of where, where they are. Uh, certainly, there's going to be uh, uninsured affected in some of the you know, more rural communities, but that's where the bulk of the sort of working uninsured lives.
Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Thorpe. That was a great um, quick overview. You did a lot in just a short amount of time. Appreciate you coming to the to the council meeting. Well, thank, thanks um, for having me on. And uh, I wish you the best with your deliberations. Do great things there. And uh, again, congrats for uh, really focusing on this uh, really important set of issues. Thanks, Ken. Mm -hmm. All right. Great, okay. Um, we are now going to move to the next part of our meeting where we're gonna go into the breakouts. Um, before we go into the breakouts, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the revised guiding principles. Um, you all got a copy earlier this week uh, of those principles and wanted to just go over um, very briefly the changes that we made as, as a result of the feedback that we got um, a couple of things, we made some, um, added some introductory language to reflect the purpose of the principles, um, that they should be used as a guide to the development of more specific ideas for how to improve healthcare coverage in North Carolina. We combined um, the first two principles to highlight um, that as healthcare coverage is maximized, it needs to be affordable. That was a comment that we got throughout the discussions in the last meeting. Um, we added two principles, one on ensuring that coverage options are simple to navigate for consumers and providers, and another centering around the overall goal of improving the health of North Carolinians. So, slide. Um, on this set of principles, health system sustainability, efficient use of taxpayer dollars, and strengthening our rural communities, there's some small word changes, but nothing very significant. So, it will look fairly similar to what you all saw in the last meeting. And then the next um, group of principles around reducing disparities, expanding access to and coverage of behavioral health services and supporting the business community. Um, we added some background information on behavioral health parity in the footnotes, but really largely these also remain the same as what you all saw last week. And then finally, um, the additional considerations for access. So um, we added to this list and became more specific. Um, in follow up to a request of a number of you talking about lowering the cost of care, strengthening telehealth infrastructure, workforce development, access to primary care and social determinants of health. So those are some of the additions that we have um, in this list here. Okay, great. So um, what we're going to do next, I actually did wanna just ask if, if folks can write, uh, make sure their full name is being displayed um, in their Zoom um, picture because we are going to go to breakout sessions. We want to make sure the right people get to the right places. I think most of you actually have that, but if if you have some, if you don't have your name there, please just add that. So we're now going to go, uh, we're going to be automatically sent to our breakout rooms. It will be the same breakout rooms as we had last time. We here at Duke Mark Goal List will be the neutral note takers as we were last time around, and we will keep time and um, keep everyone going. Um, this will be about um, 40 minutes or so. Um, is that right, still Elaine? We're still on track for that? Okay. Um, one member of the group will be asked to report out when we come back together like we did last time. And really, we wanted to give you just the space to talk in a little bit more detail about the principles as we move towards finalizing them. Are there any other ideas or thoughts that you want to have added to them? Wanted to be sure to give you space to do that. Um, we also wanted to um, give you space to talk about like how can these translate into specific strategies. So all of that may not be reflected in the written document, but we know some of you want to talk, you know, more specifics around behavioral health and telehealth and what are some some real ideas that can move some of the concepts and the principles forward. Um, there's also, I think, things that you all want to talk about around association health plans or tax credits or other ideas to support businesses targeted limited Medicaid expansion, licensure and scope of practice changes. So, so these breakout sessions, you know, don't feel like you have to stick to what's on the page. This can also be a place to talk about additional ideas, even if they don't got, get all reflected in the document itself. We will have a meeting summary where we're going to um, summarize all of the different conversations happening in these breakout groups. So to the extent that, you know, there's lots of other good ideas on telehealth and behavioral that emerge from this, we can definitely um, capture that in the meeting summary, which we will send out to all of you and also make public um, on our website. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, we will be recording the small group conversations, um, just you know, as we have been doing for the larger group when we're all together. So we will continue to do that. And those will be available um, for the public after we conclude our sessions. Um, the last thing I will just say here, um, 
is just to keep in mind as we think about how to move forward, you know, I think there's been a lot of interest on, you know, thinking about different pieces that can can really um, impact lots of different parts of the population and how to help different aspects of our healthcare system. So really want to encourage you all to have a very frank discussion about all of that in your breakout groups. Um, you know, again, as I said at the outset, I really uh, feel like this is the beginning of the conversation of, you know, going into 2021 and what could be um, really helpful and useful for North Carolina. So want, want you all to feel like you can use that time to be very frank and open and, and have a really good discussion. Any questions before we break into the groups? Amy, are you going to display those uh, principles thus far for each group as we're discussing? Yes, we will. Okay. So you don't have to memorize them. Yes, okay. we will have them up on the Good. screen. No worries. Yes. Anything else before we move into our groups? That was a good question. Okay. All right. So we'll be back here together. Um, about 1130. So, all right. See you all shortly. Thank you. I hope all the breakout sessions were as lively as ours was. Uh, we, we had a great conversation and lots of great ideas. So um, hopefully that's the case for everybody. I think we're going to take the next um, 20 minutes or so to go around and hear um, the suggestions from the different groups. And then we here at Duke Margolis are going to combine all of those thoughts and get to the final set of principles, um, which we will then send around to you all next week for you know any last review uh, before we move on to actually going and publishing them and, and saying, here we are, here's the, here's work that the council provided. So um, why don't we just get started because I, I know we're gonna be short on time. So Elena, I'm gonna turn to you for group one to see who your spokesperson was who wants to report back. Sure. Uh, Gene did such a good job last time that he got nominated to do it for us once again. Yeah, I got, I got voluntold, as they say. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, I, I think generally we, we, we thought the, the, the principles were, were, were really good as, and reflecting back on them. I think this is more in, in, in the lines of refining them. On the maximum coverage, we, we actually wanted to move up this concept of, of sustainability and maximizing taxpayers' dollars to make sure that we're getting uh, the, the best return in terms of coverage. Uh, we like the idea that there was, there was carve outs uh, and they were named, but the, sometimes it's counterintuitive that you could spend the same amount of money and get more, more folks covered. So I think that was one of the things that, that we highlighted and we actually moved that up in, in, the, uh, in the principles. Uh, when we looked at healthcare sustainability, we really wanted to in insert this idea that we really need to have a long-term view, so long-term sustainability. So as we're modeling out different payment mechanisms and things of that nature, we wanted to make sure we understood the implications uh, long-term on the infrastructure support for health and, and, and care. So that came out on the behavioral health piece of it. We wanted to insert this uh, community-based network that needed to support uh, uh, healthcare, and, and as as we sort of deinstitutionalized uh, behavioral health, uh, there's a recognition that there's not enough community resources by which um, we can provide support. So we wanted to make sure that that was more specifically embedded uh, on the businesses and supporting businesses. Uh, clearly, small business small businesses need need help. We also had the. Uh, talked about equitable uh, 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 distribution of CARES Act funding and things of that nature. So we want to make sure there's equity in terms of that. But also this concept of we didn't want to exclude big businesses because also they have the burden of, of costs and we wanted to make sure they were reflected there. And then there's also the idea that, that you have larger businesses that actually can provide resources and support to the smaller businesses. And we wanted to allow for policy solutions uh, for, that, for that to happen. On the disparities piece, we did include um, gender and, and sexual orientation. Uh, we had this conversation as you start listing, you may miss some, uh, uh, some, some disparate group, but we also recognize that there's specific groups that we really need to focus on, at least initially. Um, so those were the, the key areas. The only other thing that I would add is there was, we, we had a lot of conversation in terms, these four meetings that we've had have been enriching and there's been a lot of aha moments and it's gonna be important to define 
how do we package this? Uh, some of us are more visually oriented. Uh, how do we take the key learnings, the key aha moments, the key uh, conclusions, so that when we go from here, we have the ability to talk to legislators, business communities, and, 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 and have a broader uh, conversation uh, of enrollment with North Carolinians. So I think that was, that was uh, hopefully team, I summarized that uh, okay. Way to go, Jean. Thanks. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Any um, immediate reactions to those comments before I move to the next group? Okay. All right. Um, and we have a couple, I have a couple of things to reflect on once we go through all the groups, um, to how we pull it all together. So why don't we go to group two, Rebecca, who is your spokesperson? That would be Chip again. He was also oh, Chip. Okay, yeah. voluntold. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, the voluntold continued. Um, yeah. We too uh, agreed with Gene and his group uh, that these were well laid out. We appreciate the, the continued work that was done here. Um, but we spent a lot of time trying to figure out which ones of these we needed to highlight in order to get the dominoes started and, and really get things moving. So first of all, the maximizing healthcare, absolutely, we need to highlight that. We spent a lot of time talking about not only the the care needing to be comprehensive, but needing to be preventative. That if we were not focusing on preventative care, that we weren't really going to save any money for anybody down the road. Uh, so that was very important. We also highlighted um, uh, health system um, sustainability and, and really wanted to emphasize the independent provider in there well, that needs to be a total uh, sustainability, especially with a focus on rural mm -hmm. communities. Uh, we didn't feel like that was really called out there. That, so that was number two that would really make a domino impact occur. Number three was focusing in on reducing health disparities. And by hitting those health disparities, having residual on other social determinants of health um, and the disparities that would be occurring there and expanding access to coverage of behavioral health services. Uh, all four of those were really highlighted more, even though we thought some of the others were, were very important, those we felt like moving forward on those would have a benefit <laughs> of supporting the business community, strengthening our rural communities, utilizing taxpayer dollars better, uh, that sort of thing. Um, on the strategy side of the conversation, we spent a lot of time on, on the additional considerations list at the bottom, uh, talking about telehealth and how uh, Medicaid has done a good job talk, uh, considering keeping the telehealth services in place that, that have emerged through COVID and how that just needs to become standard practice going forward because that uh, is, has been such a successful way in delivering especially behavioral health services and eliminating some of the inequities that have been faced by many as they sought behavioral health services in the past. Uh, Dr. Mancan talked about 40% reductions in no-show. I mean, that's that's a huge piece. He talked about overcoming the disproportionate or, or um, uh, uh, disparate location of services where you might be in a rural community and the service not even be available or it might be too difficult to get to a service if you're in an urban community and telehealth kind of eliminates that. So it really levels the playing field for folks. Um, and then also just overcome, I'm sorry, overcoming the distribution problems that we have of where providers are uh, not readily accessible. Um, the last thing we talked about is the fact that these conversations have been incredible and we could really use more of them. Um, you know, that when we're in these smaller conversations, people are able to really vet ideas more and have more um, dialogue than even we've been able to have in the larger group. And um, we felt like that's where we've made the most gains. It would be great to see opportunities for that uh, going forward. That's great. Um, thank you. Any immediate reactions from other folks? Sounds like you accomplished a lot in your breakout, so. Okay. All right, we're gonna keep going. And, and um, to your point, Chip, about potential for, you know, additional, you know, conversations and whatnot, I think we're actively talking about that, at least on the Duke Margolis side. And so, um, you know, happy to keep thinking about that as we look forward, so. So thank you for that. Okay, um, group three was Will. Who is your spokesperson? All right, today we have Reg Henderson. Reg, okay, excellent. 
and Reg, just direct me to scroll through and I'll set it up for you. Okay, um, we had a, a lively and robust discussion in our group and and I'm just echoing some of the, um, from Chip and, and Jean um, that we thought that the principals, you know, they were very thoughtful and, and, and well done and, and, and captured a lot of the, the nuance. But when, when we, but when we looked at it deeper, um, we did say, um, we, we kept coming back to a thing that healthcare coverage is um, foundational. And that one, that, that principle, it, it's rightfully put at placed as the number one principle. And we saw that the other, a lot of the other principles there are the, um, are the underpinnings um, to help achieve that. So that's when we, when we even thought about how you present it to um, the public or, or, or how it's, uh, is there an infographic or something that really shows that that is uh, the core guiding principle with the others of underpinnings to help achieve that. Um, we would, um, some of the concerns that we had, we'd like it to, to be, there was discussion about liking it to be more explicit about um, the scale of different options. <laughs> Um, we talked about keeping in mind that um, we'll be trying to have this conversation in the North Carolina General Assembly and that it'll be a, a, a process. And, and so we can agree on principles, but need to strategize about what that process is. And um, any action from this group must not result in any harm for access and coverage and outcomes. So just moving to the piece about the, the strategies, if you scroll down some, okay. Um, again, you know, the maximizing healthcare coverage is foundation. And there was a lot of discussion. This kept coming back up over and over again um, about more specific emphasis on Medicaid expansion when you're thinking about how do you achieve it that has to be part of the conversation, um, recognizing that there are other low hanging fruit that, that's listed into, a lot of them listed into the additional considerations for access, like um, strengthening the telehealth infrastructure and, um, and, and supporting access to primary care and preventative services. But the thing kept coming back, yes, um, in a strategy, to, to, to make sure that we're continuing to build up the momentum and people seeing some success, try to take on some of those, um, the low hanging fruit, but not forgetting um, having short midterm and long-term goals. And one of them as part of that, at least as a um, critical part of the discussion is Medicaid expansion and, and really exploring, um, do we go that route? What the pros and cons? And we even went, um, we had a very, um, a, a group that represented diverse um, perspectives and me being in big business and us going back um, and forth with, with questions um, um, with if, if we had something like Medicaid expansion, some of the folks who are currently covered under our plans at, at Lowe's and other big employers would then be met, eligible for Medicaid expansion. Would you want that unintended consequence of them not to be covered on our plan. And we fleshed some of that out and recognizing we didn't have all the answers, but the theme is you have to have the discussion. And in thinking about next steps after today's meeting, um, a robust communication plan. It has to be, this has to be really communicated. So it is widely dispersed and people really understand um, the principles and, and what we're trying to do and who is held accountable for that. And I, I've already stated, we could really do this in three phases, short-term, medium-term, long-term, in terms of tackling the low-hanging fruit, um, and then really um, getting to some of the other pieces and not forgetting that Medicaid expansion has to at least be part of that conversation. Um, group, did I miss any of, of the big rocks, anything that I missed that you'd like to um, bring out? Thank you. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, great work, group three. Um, 
lots to think about in terms of um, next steps and also some, some maybe some language changes. Any um, immediate reactions from um, other folks who are not in group three commenting on that? Okay, great. All right, group four. So I was voluntold to be the spokesperson again for the group. So I am going to um, share my screen and just, um, just briefly walk through what group four, we had a great discussion, a lot of thoughtful um, engagement on these different principles. A couple things, um, we actually looked at some of the words pretty carefully. Um, so so wanted to just share those thoughts here. So on the maximizing healthcare coverage, the first thing we wanna just um, highlight is the promoting enrollment in bronze plans. Our suggestion was to um, be more broad and say changing to promoting enrollment in marketplace plans because bronze may not be the best option for everybody given the high, they often have high deductibles. Um, so that's one thing that we wanted to be sure to share with the group and make sure that nobody had any concerns around that. Um, any immediate concerns on that? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay. All right. Um, then there was also um, ideas around um, adding that concept of health savings accounts um, to the list of thinking through what could be options for folks to be able to think about how to afford coverage. Moving on, um, program simplicity. So I think everyone agreed this was a, a laudable goal that is really needed in our healthcare system because things are so complex. And I, I think we may have lost uh, Hamey there uh, to, at a critical time. Um, uh, oh, Hamey. Back, sorry, I lost you for a moment. No, okay. Well, well, my internet connection is unstable. Let me see. Hopefully yeah, you were talking about simplicity. Yeah. Okay. Um, you may want to go so, off video if that uh, helps. Okay. Let me go off video and see if that's gonna um, help me. Um, okay. So because now it's not letting me go off video. Okay. Well, I'm gonna keep going and tell me if something happens again. All right, so for the program simplicity, so, you know, we won't write all of this, but, you know, definitely thinking about how in implementation that can actually work, making sure people have access and ease um, in applying for coverage. We talked about having phone options where there are people who actually can help people um, when they call up and want to get um, information about how to um, sign up for coverage. So thinking about those pieces, I think was very important to our group. Um, one question for Julia, if Julia is still on. Um, so your cost projections for Medicaid expansion, Julia, the question was, did those projections include administrative costs, you know, that would, you know, you'd have to, to build in for things like, you know, enrollment and um, phone access and different ways of, of um, enrolling folks. We just wanted to confirm that was the case. Is Julia still on? I'm, I'm here. The numbers, yeah, the numbers provided didn't, didn't include an explicit add-on for admin. Um, it's, it's very small though, for the most part, assuming that we build on our current, what's currently the, the current, I'll say chassis for our Medicaid program. The more bells and whistles and new special things you add on, the more costly it will be from an administrative perspective. Okay. That might just be a follow-up point. Um, yep. if folks, yeah, we have, we, have those we have those estimates available. We can follow up. Okay, okay. Um, for the efficient use of taxpayer dollars, um, we had a conversation around uh, potentially changing that because I think we had in here optimizing federal matching funds. And um, it, I think the conversation was we don't want to turn people off right away um, and box them into thinking about one particular option when there could be a lot of different pieces on the table. So we um, were considering um, either deleting the phrase or there was some interest in really keeping it, but just um, expanding it a little bit to say, including by considering the use of federal matching funds and other sources where possible. So just to reflect that, you know, it's not just about um, optimizing federal dollars, but there'll be other ways to, to pay for coverage options and thinking about those more holistically. So that was that. Um, we talked quite a bit about um, supporting the business community. And so, you know, I think everyone agreed again that these principles were great, but the small businesses, um, the word support is, is quite
quite high level and that's okay, but if there's any consideration of if there is any more specific or stronger language to use in support. Um, the other thing we talked about is um, really not wanting to tie this to COVID-19 issues for you know providing coverage um, by small businesses and frankly other businesses have, list, have existed long before COVID-19. So um, we wanted to suggest deleting this last piece because we don't want to tie it to just a COVID-19 response. It's, this is really a, a much longer term um, issue to tackle. And so we don't want to you know, box in any sort of idea that has to be, okay, because it's, it's because of COVID, it's during COVID and then we, you know, things are solved. So I um, want to suggest deleting that. And I think some of the language around the groups that talked about sort of short term, you know, longer term, medium term and longer term, this kind of goes into that bucket. These are sort of longer term goals. Um, then just the additional considerations for access. We got through some of this, but then we had to come back to this big group, so we didn't get through all of it. But um, really an interest in taking out um, specific, specifying infrastructure and broadband access. And I think another group that added some of those additional co considerations for telehealth was getting to the same point. Wanted to keep a lot of different things on the table for what can happen with telehealth um, because it's not just about the broadband access. There's a lot of other pieces to make sure that people are going to be able to um, get services that they need. So, so wanted to just take out this, um, what, what the group thought was could be limiting when we don't mean it to be limiting. Group, anything else I missed? No, okay. Any reactions from other folks? Uh, this is Representative yeah. Adcock. I think you're right on yeah. the money in getting the references to COVID-19 out of this document. I'm gonna tell you why. Uh, just reinforces what you said. Certainly these issues are made worse by COVID, but they were not created by COVID. They pre-exist COVID by decades. And um, so I think that's really smart. And I think as you're in the business bullet, if you're trying to come up with a word you think is stronger or better than support, I would just look to our business reps in the group to give you feedback on that. We have both the Retail Association, the North Carolina Chamber. We also have reps of nonprofit businesses and small for-profit businesses is, uh, and I guess they're both large and small. And I think they can, you know, if they're comfortable with that wording, we're probably good. And if they can come up with a better wording, there's nobody better to do that. So that would be my suggestion. Great suggestion. This is Representative Cunningham. And I, I kind of got a question on the um, yeah. supporting the business community. I haven't seen an example of the financial impact to a small business that has less than 50 um, if they're going into trying to do the, the associated health care plan or if they're trying to do the ACA exchange or if they're, they have another option available to them. What is that financial and, and looking at how we can improve that? Um, I haven't seen an example and I would like to see a sample example of that financial impact on that small business because I guess you have to have something concrete to move forward and how to assist them. Anyone from the business community want to comment on that? So this is Andy Allen, Representative Cunningham. I, and I don't know that I had the, the full answer to your question. Uh, I think the documents that we were sent the other day on um, before this meeting and it broke down the premium differential between greater than 50 employees and less than 50 employees and the deductibles and, and things like that. And, and Senator Woodard and, and I were having this conversation the other day and he was having it today in our small group breakout. Those are pretty significant um, differentials. And what you sometimes have is if you have an, a business with five employees and Senator Woodard talked about this, they're, they're competing for talent with larger businesses. And in some of those cases, the, you know, the monthly premium was four or $500 difference. So even if you're paying the same salary or a higher salary as a larger business, that employee has to make a financial decision. Do they stay or go with the larger business or do they instead, you know, come or move to a, a smaller business, even at a higher salary because they're net net at the end of the day less. And so I think that's the thing we're still trying to get our arms around. I think, you know, the documents also parlayed out there, um, you know, the, the pathway to association health plan that we thought we might be able that North Carolina enacted, but it's a subject to litigation. Um, may be pulled back because the Biden administration may re pull back on the Department of Labor rule that allow for those pathway to association health plans. And so we have some things to figure out depending on sort of the, the stance and the, the action taken by the administration going forward uh, from the federal level. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think those, those charts were really, to me, were really 
demonstrative of, of the differential between small group coverage and large group coverage and what that means into the marketplace. Hey, Rosemary Cunningham, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. Um, I myself had ran a small business um, several years ago, a Subway franchise. I was the operator and the owner of it. And it was just a financial burden to try to pay them a livable wage and to provide the um, insurance coverage. And for a small business um, to go into the, a the ACA and look at the exchange and getting the people to cover on that, it was very expensive, maybe $30,000 and upward. So that was kind of where I was looking at is those options um, to the business community. What can we do to improve on that? And it may take some federal legislation up there in, at the federal level um, to improve the ACA so that more smaller businesses can go within the ACA exchange and it be more financial uh, you know, appropriate for them. Thank you. Jimmy, right. could I weigh in since uh, yeah, Andy mentioned the conversation and I'm sorry, I don't wanna get off track too far, but the concern, I've had this concern for a while, but I recently had um, conversation with a group of small business owners and my district is some of you know my district I mean I'm home to RTP and downtown Durham where we have a lot of startups going on either high tech or pharma life science and a lot of these but I also represent two rural counties where there are small businesses but in talking with some of my startup entrepreneurs these are folks who start out as many of you know in their garage or uh, the spare bedroom with two or three employees. And, and the challenge they're finding is that they can't hire and retain the talent they need to grow their business uh, because they're in that gap. You know, when they can get to 50 and 100 employees, everybody will write them a policy and, and they're great. How do they retain, how do they first attract those employees and retain them? You know, they're, we're lucky in, in the triangle area that, you know, often, uh, someone will move here with a spouse who may be working for an employer who provides insurance. But if you don't, um, uh, it's very hard to find that. And, and I know we try to address that with the association health plans, but for those three, four, five, six employee companies, um, it is a real struggle. And I think it is stifling entrepreneurship and the growth of small business. Then you turn around and you look at rural um, communities where uh, a good percentage of those businesses are those five, six, you know, employee kind of companies. I was, I was judging a Brunswick stew contest Saturday, so I have to tell you where I was, but the host of it was a restaurant owner. Um, and we were talking about health insurance between my uh, different tastes of Brunswick stew. Um, but we were talking about the challenges he has um, helping his six employees find insurance. So we got to work. Thank you. So anyway, yeah, so yeah. I, I, I pontificated no. a little bit, but I, I did want to share that concern. It, oh. it, it's hurting the growth of, of um, small businesses and it's hurting the, the entrepreneurship, uh, whether that's in RTP or in uh, Hurdle Mills, North Carolina, it's hurting us. So anyway, yeah. all right. No, no, thank you for sharing. And and I just did want to be cognizant. We are, we we're supposed to end at 12.15 and we have the governor on the line. So um, if the last group can just be very brief in your comments um, and then we can um, keep moving along. Thank you. So Kirk, who is your spokesperson? I'm on mute, sorry. <laughs> um, that was Merritt again. So Merritt, okay. take it away. Merit. Yeah. Maybe we can just uh, jump to um, our the next step section, or if you want to go over this, uh, the efficient use real quickly. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, so I think under the efficient use of taxpayer dollars, we, we kind of tried to wordsmith that a little bit as well and talked about um, changing it to securing and optimizing. Um, uh, those are two different ideas and I think both important and also uh, we're feasible. So uh, we uh, don't feel, people don't feel like we're locking in on a particular concept or idea. Um, so that, that was kind of how we wanted to maybe think about modifying that. Um, in, in terms of uh, translating principles into action, we talked about the importance of laying out almost a business plan or a, a, an action strategy. Uh, Steve Lawler was mentioning that and, and talking about 
you know, concurrent efforts and how they kind of work together. Um, we, we talked about acknowledging uh, current um, a regulatory uh, environment, um, litigation, federal parameters and things like that as we make plans. We talked about um, uh, hoping that, that all stakeholders would have some skin in the game, a uh, concept of moral hazard and making sure that, that everyone in some way, shape or form uh, is, is contributing and, and has a, uh, is really engaged in what's going on so that this, uh, the impact is positive and is maximized. Uh, we talked about um, uh, the need uh, for actionable uh, goals. Uh, the, the, the concepts are, are, um, and principles are fantastic, but working toward actionable goals um, would be, uh, would be uh, valuable. Um, and that includes giving legislators uh, tools to work with. Um, we also talked about uh, um, more discussion, uh, kind of echoing other comments about um, uh, how do we help small businesses um, uh, and uh, uh, Andy Allen just uh, spoke uh, to that, as did Senator Woodard. Um, uh, we talked about um, uh, examining existing policies and statutes and, and looking for opportunities to uh, amplify or modify those to work toward a goal. Um, we talked about uh, um, uh, the, the positive and then concerning uh, aspects of Georgia's Medicaid expansion effort and uh, things that we might be able to learn from that. And then uh, we talked about uh, other ideas, uh, healthcare vouchers, almost like education vouchers, uh, telemedicine, we emphasize that, greater use of primary care and prevention and not the emergency room, and then building in flexibility and plan design, um, and that uh, uh, the chosen solution uh, um, patchwork would hopefully uh, reduce the overall cost of healthcare in North Carolina. So that, that's a brief summary of our um, efforts Fantastic. to translate principles to action. Thank you, thank you. And um, I'm just gonna turn it to Mark just briefly, but just for y'all to know next steps, we are going to incorporate all of this great feedback into the document. We will probably not have all of the words that, that, that are on these pages in, in the principles, but we are gonna have all of those words in the meeting summary. So we're gonna send out those um, documents back, both of those documents out to you all next week. So you can send any, you know, sort of final comments or thoughts to us. And then next steps, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark quickly and then we're gonna go to the governor. Go ahead, Mark. Great, uh, we wanna thank you very much for your engagement in this council. You've created a forum that resulted in meaningful discussions across a lot of diverse perspectives. And as Hamie just said, because of your work, we're gonna be able to put together some strong foundational principles as a guide and to provide some momentum for further action on these important issues related to affordable coverage. It's been a privilege for all of us at Duke Margolis to support this group. This is the last official meeting of the council, but we did want to encourage you to reach out as conversations that we've started here continue beyond this meeting. We're already uh, participating in some of those, including with the business community and small businesses. And this is all consistent with our core mission at Duke Margolis about helping to advance innovative approaches to improving health and health care for North Carolinians. So we're happy to support you in whatever ways we can as this important work continues. And now I would like to thank Governor Cooper for his efforts to bring this group together and turn to him for the closing remarks for this meeting. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. And I'm so grateful to each and every one of you for the time that you've given. All of you are extremely busy, busy in, in your lives right now, but to give the amount of time that you've given is deeply appreciated. And I appreciate the dedication and forthrightness and honesty that has gone on in these discussions. I've heard a lot of them and I've read the summary reports every week and obviously have continued to talk with Dr. Cohen. And Mark and Hamey, we wanna thank you and the entire team at Duke Margolis for stepping up and helping us with this, a tremendous job very complicated issue. You guys have helped to put it in an understandable way and in a way that we can uh, discuss it in an intelligent way. And bringing all of these uh, disparate uh, factions together to have substantive conversations and to lead it toward a goal, I'm really appreciate, I really appreciate the, the good work. And this council has been working for only two months, but you have made some astounding progress in tackling 
some of the most difficult issues that we face. I, I pr particularly appreciate the diversity of ideas and experiences that you guys have brought to this work. And as a result, I think these guiding principles that you've helped to develop will carry significant weight as we go forward. Uh, they are truly bipartisan principles, and I think they reflect a wide range of perspectives. Obviously, uh, we're gonna be talking about specific ways to try to, to get us toward the goals that, that we've set for ourselves, and I, and I look forward that, to that. But we've heard from businesses, we've heard from nonprofits, from healthcare providers, to community partners, and all have contributed greatly to this work. There's obviously a lot to be done. And I think though we ought to keep these principles ahead of us as a roadmap uh, that we follow whenever we have discussions on healthcare and particularly healthcare coverage. I look forward to working with legislative leaders to build on this momentum uh, we've had strong leaders from both parties in the General Assembly participating in this. And as we start entertaining specific proposals on getting high quality health care to people all over North Carolina, I hope that we can continue to refer back to these principles. You know, what, what, what do we want to accomplish here? Um, you all, there's no secret, I'm a strong supporter of Medicaid expansion, but this council has demonstrated that there are many ideas and perspectives and proposals that need to be considered as we look at solutions that are right for our state. Uh, I appreciate the sense of urgency too that, that you brought to the work. Uh, I know we had some discussions here at the end about these are long-term goals and we don't need to look at it just uh, because of the pandemic. But the fact of the matter is that the pandemic has exposed a lot of these challenges that we are already facing and it has magnified those challenges. So uh, we really need to tackle it as we jump into this session of the General Assembly and I hope we will. And I, I know the Duke Margolis uh, team is committed to keeping this group engaged and connected as we work during the upcoming legislative session. And uh, when we think about all of the North Carolinians that are working so hard to keep their family afloat, get their kids educated to stay healthy, uh, that healthcare coverage can be a real blessing to North Carolina families. And as we take all of these ideas moving forward, uh, I hope that we can make sure we find ways that North Carolinians can get this quality health care, that we respect taxpayer dollars, and that we work together toward these common goals that this very uh, distinguished group has laid out. So thank you for your service and thank you for allowing me a few moments here. Thanks everyone. We're looking forward to next steps. <laughs>